All right, this video is our first um, review for cycles, um, going back and looking at the second law. Now, this presumes that you've covered this material in a previous course, and this is just a review, so I'll go fairly fast. Um, first of all, a cycle, when we talk about a cycle, just simply means you've got a series of simple processes, and you start at a state, and at the very end, your final state has exactly the same conditions. So, really, you've made no progress in some sense. Now, when you talk about cycles, we're going to categorize them as every cycle is either a heat engine or a power cycle or a refrigerator. Okay, so I'm going to call a heat engine frequently a power cycle. A refrigerator it could also be a heat pump. The difference between these two is the power is produced in a power cycle or a heat engine, and it is required in a refrigerator or a heat pump. And that one simple thing can be used to make all of our definitions for all of our cycles. Now, the first law for any cycle says that if I go from the beginning to the end and add up all the heat transfer effects, it's going to exactly equal beginning to end all of the work effects that I would have. Now, if I'm focusing right now on only heat engines, then power is produced, so the network is going to be positive. If network equals net heat transfer, that means that the net heat transfer has to be positive, and so heat input will be required in order to produce power. Okay. Now that is simply a result of the first law. If we go ahead and look at the second law, I can start doing things like defining cycle efficiencies. Now a cycle efficiency is just a way of quantifying how good design is. And one way we do this is using a ratio of whatever our desired effect is divided by the cost or energy input. Okay. For a heat engine, my goal is power. Okay, that's why I produce power plants, right, is to build power so I can turn it into electricity, so I can sell it, and I can power the lights in our rooms. All right, so that's my desired effect is power. Now, what does it cost? Well, it's going to cost some sort of energy. So, say in Oklahoma, we have a lot of coal-fired plants. So that energy that I'm putting in, that coal energy, is going to be my Q sub H. That's the cost of operating this plant. So the ratio of those is going to be what I'll call a thermal efficiency. Now, since the net work is equal to the net heat transfer, and that's equal to QL plus QH if I have a simple heat engine where I have just two temperature reservoirs, so I have all heat coming from some high temperature source and all heat going into a single low temperature reservoir, then I'm going to produce power QH is in, QL is out, so this is a heat loss. And so this is going to be positive, this one is negative. QH plus QL is going to be the net Q. And so QH over QH is 1, QL over QH is QL over QH, and I end up with this result. Which is fine, but remember that QL is going to be out of the system, it's a heat loss. So it's negative, and QH is into the system, it's positive. So sometimes it's more convenient to think of things in terms of absolute values. Right? And if I do that, then I end up with 1 minus the value of the heat loss divided by the value of the heat input. And this, any of these, are ways of calculating the thermal efficiency for a power cycle. So, what does the second law tell us about a cycle? Well, okay, first of all, it's going to give me limitations on cycles. That's really what the second law does. One of the statements of the second law is a kelvin planck statement, and it says that it's impossible to construct a device that operates in a cycle, okay, so one of our power plants, whatever, and produces no effect on the surroundings other than producing work and exchanging heat with a single reservoir. Okay. So I can't, coming back to this picture here, I can't just bring in heat and have 
work produced, I also have to have heat exchange at the second reservoir, which is my heat loss. Okay, so what it really is telling me, this statement, is that I can't turn heat directly into work. There's always going to be some sort of heat loss, or the heat input is always going to be larger than the amount of work I'll produce. Now, if the net work, W, is smaller than QH, then this value here has to be less than 1. Also, I've already said that each of these is going to be positive in a heat engine, so this thermal efficiency is going to be trapped between the values of 0 and 1. Now, I want to turn for just a brief moment to the Carnot cycle. And the reason we study the Carnot cycle is because it gives us ideas of these limitations. Now this is a pretend cycle, this doesn't exist, but in the 1800s Saudi Carnot developed this idea, this conceptual cycle, and he basically said, okay, well if I totally reversibly expand stuff at a constant temperature TH, it's going to bring QH in to the cycle. And then I'm going to do an adiabatic and reversible expansion and drop the temperature to TL, then I'm going to isothermally compress it and get rid of the heat, and then I'm going to adiabatically compress it to raise the temperature. Okay. Now, through a lot of studies of this, the guy had a lot of time on his hands. Okay. Several different results, but two that are very important for us is one, it says that there's no way to construct an engine that operates between these two reservoirs, my temperature for heat source and heat sink, that's any better than a reversible engine operating between these same reservoirs. And the Carnot cycle is one such reversible engine. So the actual efficiency I'll ever get is going to be less than whatever I can come up with for a reversible cycle. He also came up with the idea that the engines that operate on these reversible cycles, or a Carnot cycle, between two constant temperature reservoirs, any way I could possibly do it, whether it's Carnot or something else, if it's reversible, it just depends on what those temperatures are. And we can use this to develop a thermodynamic temperature scale. And this is the absolute temperature scale. Okay, This is the one that we use when we're talking about Kelvin's or an English units using Rankine. And this result tells me that the ratio of the heat transfers in absolute value is equal to the ratio of the temperatures if I use this absolute temperature scale. Now this is only going to be valid for a reversible cycle or a Carnot cycle. But it's useful because now I can combine that with what I already knew about thermal efficiencies network over heat transfer in is the same as 1 plus QL over QH. Well, if I'm looking at these in terms of values, it's 1 minus QL over QH. And if it's reversible, then I can replace this with temperatures. So 1 minus TL over TH. And these quantities here could be probably better stated if I had parentheses. Okay. So I have an upper limit to my thermal efficiencies here. Okay. That's going to be helpful to us because it's going to know, allow me to know whether or not I'm getting reasonable answers or not. Now a couple of last little things that I want to do is very quickly look at a TS plot for the Carnot cycle. And this is what it looks like. We had isothermal and reversible adiabatic or isentropic processes. And when I connect them, they go in this counterclockwise circle. And if you remember um, the definition of entropy, that Q is the integral of TDS, and that is a way of defining entropy. Um, if it's reversible, that's exactly true. And we end up that the area under this curve is Q sub H, and the area under this curve is Q sub L. And there's no during those adiabatic processes, the ones that are the vertical lines. Now the area inside this rectangle is going to be QH minus QL, which is my net Q. 
which is also my net worth. And so as a result, what I end up with is that the thermal efficiency visually for a reversible engine is the area inside this rectangle. Okay? Divided, that's my net work, divided by the heat transfer in, which is the area under this upper one. So if I want to increase the thermal efficiency, I can raise or lower this T sub L. Okay? If I raise it, the area inside the pink is small compared to the area under the entire curve. And so that gives me a, sl a small thermal efficiency. But if I lower this, then I can actually increase the area of the pink compared to the area underneath the top curve. Okay? I could also raise this and change the ratios also. Now, okay. For reversible processes, Q is the area under TS, but that's not true for irreversible. And for a reversible closed process, if I graphed PV curves, then work is the area under those. But again, not true for irreversible processes. So why do we look at these things? Well, a couple of things. One is that the area under the curves gives us a limiting value. Okay, and it helps me visualize what I could do to improve a process by doing things, simple things like lower TL. Okay. Another thing is that it doesn't take long to do a rough graph of what these states are in terms of pressure and volume or temperature and entropy. If I do that, I can tell very, very quickly, visually, that if the dots connect in the clockwise order, so going from state 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, and if they are clockwise, no matter what crazy cycle I come up with, I know that it's a power cycle. It's going to produce power. And if I connect the dots and they end up going counterclockwise, it is not a power cycle, it's a refrigerator. So those are some of our more important results from the second law that are going to help us with solving cycle problems in the next two chapters.